All right, well, I suggest we get started since there's a, there's a lot to discuss. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Vlad Perdue. I'm the director of the Klaus Center for the Study of Constitutional Democracy at Boston College um, and a professor in the law school. Um, I am delighted to uh, welcome you to today's event, um, either live or um, online, uh, registered for uh, viewers who want to look at it later. Um, neither the topic of our discussion today um, nor the distinguished guests uh, require a, a long introduction. We'll be discussing the 2020 elections um, in the United States. And we have with us um, some of Boston College's uh, most illustrious experts on American politics. We have Professor uh, Kay Schlossman, Professor Shep Melnick, and Professor David Hopkins. Um, the format of our um, meeting today, which will uh, last about 60 minutes, is that we'll hear from each of the panelists for about 10 minutes. Um, and after that, there will be a conversation. Uh, people in the audience can ask questions um, on the Q&A function. Um, I will see the questions questions and we'll curate them and then I will um, offer them to our panelists for reflection. Uh, we'll start first with Professor Schlossman um, and then we'll move to Professors Melnick and Hopkins. Uh, Kay? Thanks and thank you for holding this and thank you for inviting us. Um, I want to talk about the basics. Every ele presidential election is sui generis, perhaps especially this one, but beneath every presidential election is a set of structural regularities that need to be considered. And I want to talk about them, especially because it turns out that this year, and this is not an exception, um, what political scientists call the fundamentals predicted the outcome better than the polls did. So let me talk about five structural regularities that underlie a presidential election. And I'm gonna do them in the rough order that they vary over time or within a single presidential administration. So the first one I wanna talk about is the overall distribution of party loyalties within the electorate. And over the last half century, we've moved from a circumstance where there was a clear democratic advantage with respect to people thinking of themselves as Democrats or Republicans or as independents to a circumstance of rough balance. So we are in an unusual circumstance um, where at the one, and one important thing is that we are very polarized. Party loyalties are stronger. There are fewer genuine independents but in addition, in contrast to most historical periods in American politics, there's a real rough balance. And you can see that in a variety of ways. One is that we, um, we haven't had a genuine presidential landslide in quite a while. Uh, a lot of the, the elections really, I mean, the last lands, real landslide was 1984. Um, and all of the elections within the 21st century have been relatively close. Um, another thing, for example, is that in there are very few states that have a mixed senatorial delegation, which didn't used to be the case. So you often would have one Democratic and one Republican senator from a state. There are very few of those, which leads me to the second regularity. And this is one that's complicated, and I'm not even sure I know what the answer is, but that's the Electoral College. In this century, as you well know, we've had two elections, and this is very rare, um, in which a popular plurality of the vote did not translate into an Electoral, major electoral College majority. And so that left me thinking that um, the Democrats who in 2000 and in 2016 had a plurality of the votes in the country but did not gain an electoral college majority were in a circumstance of structural disadvantage with regard to the electoral college. Um, it is certainly the case that there are fewer competitive states than there used to be. That is more red and blue states and fewer purple states. 
Um, and I was tempted to say that the Republican dominance in a variety of small states led to their having an advantage in the Electoral College. And certainly I heard several times during the campaign that the Democrats would have to have 5 million more popular votes to get an Electoral College majority, which in fact they achieved. Um, but when I actually looked this morning and did some sort of back of the envelope uh, uh, calculations, it wasn't as clear when I looked at the states that went for the Democrats, the Republicans, or varied in the last three presidential elections that either party had an advantage. Um, that may be, uh, if I were to do this more seriously, I'd do a lot more analysis. So I'm less sure than I was four hours ago that the Republicans have a structural advantage in the Electoral College. If they do, this is a very unusual situation that the Electoral College can produce circumstances where we get a disparity between the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. The third regularity that, um, uh, that underlines any presidential election is whether there's an incumbent on the ballot. Incumbent presidents have a natural advantage in, uh, in a second election. Obviously, that was an advantage to Trump in this election. By the way, conversely, when the president is retiring voluntarily after, you know, or constitutionally after eight years, the candidate of the president's party has an aggregate structural disadvantage. But in this case, incumbency um, put Trump at a relative advantage. A second and a fourth and much more volatile measure that is part of the fundamentals is the performance of the economy. It's very clear over time that um, you that there's a, a reasonably strong correlation between economic performance and the um, performance of the president's party in a presidential election based on what political scientists call retrospective voting. Looking back and saying, you know, how are things? Am I as well off now as I was four years ago? Um, political scientists have shown that retrospective voting on the, on the basis of the economy is relatively short-sighted, uh, that, that voters don't look over a four year period, they really look at what the economy was doing in the late spring and early summer of the presidential election year. And obviously this year, it was complicated and ambiguous. Um, in the second quarter of 2020, the economy cratered, um, it decreased by 9% GDP decreased per, per quarter degrees decreased by 9%. It bounced back in the third quarter, 7.5%. Um, but if you do the arithmetic, that leaves you knowing that the economy was in the hole. Similarly, um, personal income decreased by 4% in May, 1%, one percent, one more percent in June. It bounced back by a percent in July before decreasing 3% in August. On the other hand, uh, there was um, the CARES Act with all those checks that were signed by Donald J. Trump, which may have compensated. Furthermore, um, political scientists and economists have found that the correlation between economic performance and votes for the president has diminished over time fairly recently. One of the possible reasons is all that partisanship I was talking about. And that is, it turns out that now Democrats and Republicans are looking at different things when they look at the economy. It used to be that, you know, kind of when people looked back and voted, they were all looking at the same thing. Now it's very clear that our economic evaluations are contaminated by how much we like the administration, which is related to our partisanship. 
And so Republicans were much more likely to um, give Trump kudos for economic uh, management than Democrats were. It was, however, the basis of the only um, kind of bright spot in the fifth of the fundamentals, and that is presidential approval. Here we have a real paradox for Trump. Ordinarily, presidential approval, which is another of the fundamentals and shapes how people vote, is fairly volatile within um, administration. Uh, a particularly graphic example is that um, President George H.W. Bush's approval after the successful brief Iraq war in 1991 was nearly 90%. It tumbled many percentages to below 30% by the time of the, of the election in 1992. Trump, in contrast, never reached the magic number. A president who goes into an election with less than 50% approval is facing at least an amber light. Trump is unique in never having gotten to 50%. And what's also unusual about Trump is that there was absolutely no volatility in the low to middle 40% range that um, characterized his presidential approval over a four year period. So in spite of the fact that he was getting relatively high marks for his economic um, performance, a performance that was fed by trillion dollar deficits from a tax cut that was supposed to pay for itself and didn't, um, his presidential approval never passed that magic 50% mark but what was even more unusual is that it never moved. So for this um, election, given this mixed set of circumstances, uh, there, the fundamentals predicted a relatively narrow democratic victory. And guess what? For all of the hoopla and all of, you know, sort of Trump's unpredictable drama that's actually what we got. Thank you, Shep. Thanks, Lad, and thanks to the Cloud Center for hosting this. Um, for all of the reasons that Kay just laid out with admirable clarity, this election wasn't much of a surprise. The country, as we know, is closely and de deeply divided. Once again, Democrats won a majority um, of the popular vote. I think that makes seven out of the last eight elections. The winner was determined by a relatively uh, a close vote in a small number of battleground states. As Kay suggested, given the incumbent's low approval ratings, um, the dismal state of the economy, his mishandling of the pandemic, and Trump's erratic behavior, especially in the first debate, um, it's hardly surprising that he lost. Uh, this was a clear defeat for Donald Trump, even if he won't admit it, um, but not a defeat for the Republican Party. Uh, in some way, that was one of the more surprising things. Uh, the Dem Republicans picked up seats in the House. They will probably retain their majority in the Senate. And uh, it's important to note that they did very well in state level elections, which is very important since 2021 will be a redistricting year. So this was hardly a mandate for the Democrats. Um, I'll leave it to, to Dave Hopkins to dissect some of the um, electoral results, especially for Latinos where there were some surprises um, and for other uh, sectors of the population, he's a real master at this. Um, but of course, as Kay pointed out, the big picture was that the Republicans voted for Trump despite his flaws, and Democrats uh, at least temporarily united behind Biden. Now, this is a forum from the Clow Center on Constitutional Democracy. Uh, so I, I'll focus on what this election means for constitutional government. Um, in my mind, and in the mind of many, many others, Donald Trump constituted an alarming 
uh, in an alarming way, an erosion of liberal constitutional democracy. Over and over, he violated valuable, well-established institutional norms. As we were saying before, um, violating these norms might be even more dangerous than violating laws. Um, over the last two weeks, I've been reminded of uh, Malcolm's famous line from Macbeth, where he describes the last moments of an executed man. And he says, nothing in his life became him like the leaving of it. For Trump, nothing has so become him or characterized him as his refusal to leave. Um, never before in American history has an incumbent president done so much to hinder a smooth transition to power, or even more disturbingly, to delegitimize the electoral results. President Clinton and Vice President Gore did not behave this way in 2000, despite the fact that that election was far, far closer. In 1960, Richard Nixon refused to challenge contested returns in Cook County, uh, Illinois, otherwise known as Chicago. Um, and even in 1876, when there was reason to believe that the election had indeed been stolen, Democrats went along, in part, of course, because they received something more valuable than the presidency, which was the end of Reconstruction. But my point is, is that routine, peaceful transfer of power is essential to a constitutional democracy. So is recognizing the legitimacy of the opposition. Um, Trump's recent behavior showed uh, why another four years of his administration would, I think, have been very dangerous for liberal democracy. Um, before the election, I kept reminding my friends about a scene from the movie Citizen Kane. Um, and I was going to show a clip of this, but my lack of technological ability has uh, prevented me from doing so. But the, the clip shows um, uh, Citizen Kane, uh, Charles Foster Kane, who was both a newspaper magnet magnate and uh, candidate for governor, is about to lose the election and his henchmen at the newspaper are trying to decide which headline to run. One was, Kane wins, the other was fraud at the polls. Um, and I kept reminding people that those are the two options that Trump was likely to present us with. Um, Trump wins or fraud at the polls. Those are the only two options he ever considered. Now, what, what disturbs me, what worries me deeply is not that Trump would do this, um, that's very predictable, but that so many Republicans would believe that he won and the election had been stolen. Uh, so that's my number one concern. My number two concern is that so many Republicans until very recently just stood by and said nothing knowing that that was a fraudulent claim. So here's the problem. Um, much as I and other Democratic voters saw, see Trump, saw Trump as a threat to the Republic, many Trump voters, probably most Trump voters, view Biden, Harris, Pelosi, and Schumer as an existential threat to the America that they know. Both sides question the legitimacy and the motives of the other. This has become a central feature of American politics and one that will not go away even if Donald Trump does go away. Um, so with, uh, rather than leave you with a kind of very dismal picture, um, let me give two rays of hope. First, um, despite the pandemic and despite this intense partisanship that Kay pointed out, um, the election went off with very few hitches. I, I was really worried about all the chaos that could have been created. Uh, Trump and his lawyers have searched far and wide for evidence of misconduct. Um, but they've really come up with virtually nothing. Um, state and local officials deserve a great deal of thanks, praise, and uh, admiration for the fact that they pulled this election off. Second, uh, the elections, this is a more, uh, somewhat more partisan or inter-party view. The elections dash the hope of the left wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, there'll be no green, green New Deal, no Medicare for All, no court packing. Uh, Biden will have no choice but to govern from the center, at least on the legislative front. Um, while those um, on the progressive way in the Democratic Party will no doubt disagree with me on this, um, I think that that is a prerequisite to building a stable Democratic majority. And no one has the ability to do this, I think, better than Joe Biden. Can he peel off enough Republican votes to succeed? Um, well, we'll see. On some things, probably yes. 
Um, on most things, probably no. Uh, but at the very least, uh, Biden will probably avoid the first term overreach that's characterized so many recent presidents. Uh, lest I be considered Pollyanna-ish, here are two things that worry me a lot. First, executive power. If uh, In Trump, we've seen many, many instances of the expansion and misuse of unilateral executive authority. Trump did not start this trend, but he dangerously expanded it. Given the obstacles to a legislative strategy, uh, President Biden will start off using executive orders from day one. You know, probably rely on executive action more and more as his legislative agenda remains stalled in Congress. Even if you like the results, the immediate policy results, you should worry about the long-term institutional implications. And uh, second, huge deficits. We went into COVID with peace, a booming economy, and a huge federal deficit. We will come out of it with an unprecedented peacetime deficit, an annual deficit larger than we ran up in terms of GDP in World War II. Many state governments are in even worse shape and eventually plead for bailouts. This is not only economically dangerous, but will leave little room for the programs to Democrats favor. This problem received virtually no attention during the campaign, but it will haunt our politics for decades to come. Uh, so good luck, President Biden, you're gonna need it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shep. Uh, before I turn to uh, Dave Hopkins, let me remind our viewers that they can uh, use the Q&A uh, function on the screen to send uh, to send questions for the panelists. Um, and with that, I'll turn to Dave. All right. <clears throat> thanks very much, Vlad. And thanks to all of you for uh, for showing up on a on a rainy day <laughs> uh, to uh, to listen to us. So um, uh, my, um, you know, my thought about the election is uh, my sort of big picture thought about the election is is how remarkably close it ended up being. And as Kay said, we maybe should have expected that based on the fundamentals and based on the fact that um, really pretty much all of our elections these days are close. The parties are very evenly matched in terms of national politics. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we should sort of have our default expectation, I think, be that elections are going to be very close unless proven otherwise. Um, having said that, obviously, there's a serious methodological problem with the state of polling these days. And so a lot of expectations were that this might not be a close election. Um, and uh, I think we're getting to the point where, you know, the, the, the response rates in, in opinion polls are getting so low that it's, it's beginning very difficult to get a representative sample. And, and uh, you know, this just may be a, a problem we, we live with, um, you know, uh, uh, indefinitely. Um, people thought we'd fix the problem after the polls were wrong last time, and it turns out maybe we didn't. Um, but frankly, if you look at the numbers, um, Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin were all decided by less than 1%. Um, and if all of those had flipped, Trump would have been reelected. Um, and Pennsylvania de decided by a little bit more than 1%. That's, that's a you know, regardless of the national popular vote, that is a very tight actual margin that the election was decided with. Now, a win is a win. Um, it's hard to beat an incumbent. Um, Trump is only the third elected incumbent since Hoover to be defeated for a second term. I don't want to minimize that. But I think in terms of our kind of, um, both in terms of our, uh, our interpretation of the election, but also very importantly in terms of what this means for the next four years of politics, I think the fact that it was a close election is, is very, very important. We had huge turnout on both sides, unprecedented turnout. More than a century uh, has gone by since we last had turnout um, above 65% of, of the eligible population. We also had record turnout in the 2018 midterms. Donald Trump turns out people on both sides. He turns out people who are against him and who hate him, but he also turns out a lot of people who are for him, who don't usually vote, but who vote, who come out and vote for him. Um, and that is, I think, an important takeaway of, um, of this uh, election. The fact that the election was so close and the delay in counting the votes and the mail votes being Democratic and coming at the end also, as we have seen, opens up this possibility of sort of claiming that the election was stolen. And even though there is an evidence, actual evidence, the election was stolen and the court decisions around this have been pretty uh, decisive on that, um, it, it makes, I think, a huge 
amount of difference. Um, that this wasn't like an eight point race that we all knew 10 o'clock on election night and Republicans got wiped out down the ballot. That I think was a, would, be, would lead to a somewhat different world uh, over the next four years. Instead, we have a situation where Republicans did okay um, other than the presidency, better than they thought they would do. Um, and uh, Trump lost by a little bit, and he lost in a way that he will use to claim uh, was illegitimate. And what I think this means is that he's not going anywhere, um, and that the Trump era in American politics is not over, um, and that the next four years, we're going to have a sort of a situation of Trump kind of in exile, still exercising power over the Republican Party, potentially setting himself up to run again in 2024. And if he does, I think he's immediately the strong front runner to be the nominee of the Republican Party, possibly without serious, uh, serious competition. And if he's facing a weakened Biden, or if Biden isn't running again, he's facing someone like Kamala Harris, very good chance of a Trump return to the presidency. Um, and so I think, um, you know, those of us who know a lot of conservative intellectuals who are not really big fans of Donald Trump, or we read the New York Times and read people like David Brooks and Ross Douthat and think of them as sort of leaders of the conservative movement, or we live in Massachusetts and we have Charlie <laughs> Baker as our governor and he doesn't like Trump very much. It's easy to sort of, I think, understate the power and the hold that Trump has over the conservative movement and the Republican Party more generally. It's a profound amount of power that I don't think one person has had, certainly since Reagan, and you could argue even not Reagan. And it's not Reagan's party. It's not Goldwater's party. It's not William F. Buckley's party. It's Trump's party. It's Fox's party. And that, I don't think, changes very much necessarily with Trump out of office. And when you see all these other Republicans who are so reluctant, even in defeat, to acknowledge that Trump lost, to say it's time to move on, to say that Biden's the rightful next president, you see how profound that power uh, that Trump continues to have really is. Um, and so I think we're setting ourselves up for the next four years where the, the general tenor of the conservative movement, the Republican Party, will be that Biden is not a legitimate president. And Biden, you know, was not demonized, has not been demonized personally by conservatives and by Trump the same way Obama was or Hillary Clinton. But I think this, this will sort of be the angle that will be used to a large extent, will be the idea that he is the, he is the beneficiary of this uh, supposed widespread uh, uh, fraud. Um, now, I don't mean to say, as I'm returning, we just talked all about the guy who lost and not the guy who won, um, <laughs> which uh, I guess sort of test is a testament to, to how much Trump does sort of fascinate all of us on both sides and what a big story um, it is. But it is in some ways harder to predict, um, in a sense, what the Democrats will be like for the next four years than for the Republicans. Um, I, I think we don't really know that uh, very well. Obviously, Biden, I think, personally, will try to kind of lower the temperature. Um, he's, he's not going to, to be um, as high profile or as, as polarizing in his own uh, uh, behavior. Um, as the, the past president, as Shep said, he's, he's going to be very stymied in terms of his legislative agenda in Congress. And so there, he won't be generating a lot of liberal legislation that will produce a backlash. And of course, he has a chance to be you know, successful. If, if COVID is well, well managed, we get a vaccine, we come out of the crisis, the economy returns to normal. We could be in a situation where B Biden has an overall successful presidency and a, and, a, and a reasonably popular presidency. But if things kind of go wrong for him, um, whether something within his power or outside of his power, um, I think the possibility of, of the sort of Trump, Trump era kind of roaring right back is very much, uh, very much alive. And the fact that the Democrats um, have such a narrow majority in the, uh, in the House, and if they get a Senate majority will be the barest uh, of it means, they're setting themselves up to probably lose control of Congress either way in the next midterm elections. Um, and so we're not that far away from kind of being back where we started. Uh, in four years, if uh, it, you know, if things uh, go, you know, as they very well uh, could go. So the fact that this is a close election, I think, tells us a lot about the country, uh, about the voters, um, about the distribution of votes in the electoral college. Um, but I think it also tells us something about where we're headed in the near future.
Uh, thank you, Dave, and thank, thanks to all of you. Um, we already have a, a large number of extremely interesting questions um, in the in the Q and A. So um, I will I will start. I guess that they we can we can um, classify them into sort of as as Kay was saying, sort of structural questions about American politics, and then the Trump Trumpism, um, including uh, what's going to happen in the future. Question. So let me start on the structural front. Um, a number of questions are asking um, a, something that is really fundamental, which is, you know, what is the root cause of political division um, in the country? And by that, I think the the questioner means, you know, of, of the sort of political division, uh, deep, ever deeper, ever more entrenched, the kind of polarization uh, that, that UK have, have mentioned here. Um, someone on, on a related question asks, you know, is education the way to think about it, sort of the educational divide? Um, how much do you make of the increasing educational divide in American politics? Um, why do you think it's getting wider? Um, how much of this is cultural um, versus economic? So, um, Kay, I'll turn to you and I'll see if Chef or Dave have um, anything to add to that and then we'll go for another round. I mean, I'll say a couple of things, but I want to hear what my colleagues on the panel have to say as well. So the couple of things I would say is um, in American politics, we have a tradition that will have party competition that's about one major set of issues and that sort of papers over the others. And a good way to explain it is what happened before the Civil War, where we had a national party system of Democrats and Whigs. They differed over the economy and there were strong Whig and Democrat, Democratic uh, coalitions of voters just about everywhere in the nation. It wasn't sectional. But what was really getting Americans hot under the collar before the Civil War was a sectional division over, um, over slavery. And eventually the Whigs fell apart. We, you know, the Know Nothings tried to uh, sweep in with uh, an agenda about immigration and anti-Catholicism and so on. But no, what was really getting Americans worried and angry and so on was slavery. And eventually, of course, we, we fought a war over it and we had a, a choice between Republicans and Democrats who were offering on the basis of section options on the thing that was most in their, under their, on, on their minds. Similarly, we came out of the Great Depression with competition between Republicans and Democrats on the basis of economic issues, things like taxes, regulating the economy and the size of the welfare state. But as time went on, um, there were a whole series of cultural and social issues that were very divisive and that were on people's minds. And the first one was civil rights. And um, as a result of the Democrats who had tried to straddle civil rights for, a, for more than a generation with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, casting their lot with racial justice, they began to uh, um, alienate whites in the South. And the Republicans under Nixon saw opportunities to create, um, to find white voters in the South who would, who would support them. And so what had been, uh, one thing we, that we don't always remember is that Republicans in Congress were more likely to vote for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than Democrats were. And that is because of the South. Northern Democratic liberals support, supported it and most Republicans supported it with the exception of some libertarians like Barry Goldwater. But what happened is as the Republicans pursued a strategy called their Southern strategy, the parties were offering us choices on race. And over the period of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and even into the aughts, the Republicans and Democrats began to offer us choices on everything. The Equal Rights Amendment, um, the sexual revolution, women's roles, um, abortion, which was not a partisan issue until the late 1970s, eventually, um, the environment, um, and the final big one was immigration, which was 
a divisive issue, but not a partisan issue. So what are the parties offering us choices on? The answer is everything. And one of the, the um, measures of that is the extent to which the response to the COVID emergency has been politicized. That there are party differences in terms of how serious we think it is, whether we should wear masks, what we should do about it, how we should handle um, the economy and so forth. So to answer the question, what are the structural differences between the parties? The answer is they differ on everything and voters have sorted themselves out. And even voters who um, may find themselves cross pressured. You're pro-life, but you're kind of a liberal on things like uh, health care and, and uh, welfare state issues or economic regulation and, and the environment, eventually have kind of sorted themselves out into parties and, and there's a certain amount of following public opinion. So that was the first of two and I've now talked for a while. So I will now shut up, but that was, that is the very rough, very quick story of how Part of polarization is that we just that the parties are offering us choices on everything we care about. Should I go next? Um, sure. I'll start off with an important point that my colleague Kate Flosman frequently makes, which is on anything this issue, there is not a single cause. <laughs> uh, the um, on on education. Um, it really is interesting that people without a high school education vote differently on the whole than people with a college degree, with just a high school. And there's been a, a, this odd switch. These used to be Democratic voters. These used to be part, key part of the, the New Deal coalition. The New Deal did a lot for those voters. They tend now to be voting Republican. Um, now, part of the, I think a big part of the answer is cultural. The cultural issues in which, uh, let's put it this way, um, great resentment against people like us, to put it bluntly. Um, and um, we really do live in bubbles. I know very, very few Trump voters. Um, and I think that um, those of us who live in this bubble probably are not very good at understanding Trump voters. Um, I was just reading something by Francis Fukuyama. He said, after all this time, I just don't really understand them. Um, I will say that the best thing, book I read on this lately um, is by John Shields and his co-author called Trump Democrats, which I really recommend, especially since Dave has pointed out that these Trump voters and probably Trump himself are going to be around for a long time. Uh, Dave really uh, ruined my day by his uh, explanation of how long Trump might be around. Um, but I'd point out on, on the point about cross pressure that Kay was making. There are two interesting election returns um, that didn't get a lot of attention, but Florida, Trump won much more substantially than anyone expected. And it seems that like uh, Florida has really become a relatively predictable Republican state, but its voters passed a very large increase in the minimum wage. Um, so they're voting for Trump, but also kind of taking on a traditional democratic issue. Conversely, in California, which I think voted two to one for Biden, a huge gap, um, the voters uh, opposed a proposition to end, uh, to, to bring back affirmative action by a really substantial, about 15% majority. Um, so these issues that are, are more uh, both economic and cultural um, don't always fit with the majority in the state. Um, so there are ways in which the, these voters are both cross pressured, um, but also as Kay pointed out, um, are really remain highly partisan despite these cross pressures. Yeah, I think this is all uh, exactly right. And, and my, I'll make two, two more, two, two brief points. Um, one is, um, we live in an era of what's called negative partisanship, which is basically that compared to the past, people don't like their other their own party more, but they dislike the other party a lot more. And so when we talk about why are people divided, um, they're divided because of who they dislike more than what they, they do like. 
Um, and when we see this high turnout and high engagement, I mean, I remember the days when people were lamenting the declining voter turnouts and the vanishing voter. And, you know, well, one of the most effective ways to get people mobilized is to get them angry. Um, and people are angry at the other side and they're, they'll stand in line and they'll get their absentee ballot and whatever in order to express that anger. Um, and so that turns out to be the solution to getting people, you know, involved, engaged in politics is get them angry. Everybody's angry. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about the, the education divide, and this is a very, this is an interest of mine, it's from my next, next big research project is on that. And I don't, I don't have a lot of answers yet because we're still at the early stages. But one point I, I think is really important about it is rather than thinking just about this or that specific policy issue, I think there's a more general um, thing going on here, which is the way the American society has, has changed a lot in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Some ways expressly political, in some ways not. And that's economic change, it's cultural change, it's demographic change, it's social change, it's just all kinds of different changes. And a lot of the big divide we're seeing now in politics is people who feel comfortable with those changes and even are cheering them on and people who, who feel threatened by them um, and often justifiably so threatened by them. They are, they are losing out, okay, um, you know, with these changes or certainly their perception is. And Trump's ability, you know, to sort of um, pick up on the sort of nostalgic tr uh, uh, strains of, of past glory, past national glory, and, and, and going after the people who you blame for this change is extraordinarily effective to a particular segment of the population, and especially people without education, without as much education, white people, men, um, people who live outside of the major cities, um, all the people who sort of feel like they're being left behind in various ways. Um, and that, that appeal really resonates with a lot of those people. A lot of those people used to be Democrats um, or certainly agreed with the Democrats on, on economics, but they, they're very, uh, you know, that appeal that Trump has is a very, very powerful one. And I think it ex explains a lot more than this or that issue position. It's a, it's a more general kind of theme of his persona and his rhetoric that I think just vibrates at a wavelength that some people really, really respond to. Uh, thank you. I, I want to connect now um, two of the questions that we have here. Um, the first one um, is specifically addressed to Shep, um, and I think Dave as well. Um, sort of the, although the next two years look dismal for Biden, uh, if the Republicans hold the Senate, um, many more Republican uh, senatorial seats are up in two years and um, several Republican incumbents are not planning to run. So after two years, there's a possibility that Biden might be governing um, more effectively. And to combine that with um, a, a, an invitation to uh, think of yourselves as Machiavelli to Biden, um, and that is what would you whisper in his ear? Uh, what legislative initiatives might enable him to seize the opportunity to put together the centrist cross-party coalition in favor of compromise solutions to real problems? And asking these questions also having in mind what Dave was saying about Trump, you know, not going anywhere, sort of sticking around, being very much an, a, a, a factor in American politics. So if you're, if you're Biden thinking about, of course, the Democratic Party, thinking about what policy initiatives you can get through Congress, um, thinking about the future of the country and 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 the role of Trumpism in that perspective. How, how do you think about that? What do you think sort of the next four years are gonna be um, from this perspective? Uh, let me, I'll start very quickly on this and be interested to hear what Dave has to say, especially about the Senate. Um, the scenario of in two years things being better for Biden are not very, <laughs> are very likely because the Democrats majority in the House is very thin, and in off-year elections, um, the out party does better. So it's quite possible that even if he won the Senate, uh, Democrats won the Senate in two years, they could lose the House. Um, the uh, On the question of what can Biden do, um, I, I just repeat, I think the budget deficit is going to really be uh, an albatross around his neck. Um, but he could do an infrastructure bill. I think there was support for that in Congress under Trump, and that suddenly seemed to disappear. That's a possibility. Um, uh, maybe some marginal changes in healthcare, although 
my guess is Republicans won't be too helpful on that. Um, uh, we have to do something to raise more revenue. Um, so maybe some uh, small tax increases on the wealthy. Um, I think that would probably be attractive to a variety of voters. Um, but I, I would just repeat that I think probably the most important things he's going to do, he'll have to do through executive orders on immigration and civil rights and um, a, a wide variety of other things, maybe healthcare there as well. Yeah, I just don't think there's much chance of a lot of legislative productivity, um, either before or after the midterm elections. I think the margins are too close no matter what, and uh, with the filibuster in place in the Senate and uh, the the likelihood of the House switching, I, I think Democrats, you know, often sort of judge presidents presidencies on the basis of you know all these wonderful legislative, you know, big 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 scope legislative initiatives that pass, they're going to have to temper their expectations when it comes to Biden. As Shep says, the things the president can do unilaterally are going to become much more important um, than I think uh, the legislative coalition building. It's just, I just don't think the conditions are really there for it. Maybe a COVID relief bill, maybe smaller stuff, but nothing too big, nothing too, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing too profound. And I, I would just we add- We should also- um, just remember that another thing that may need doing is some kind of federal help to deal with the, the pandemic yeah. and whether the whether under Biden the federal government will be in a position to help get millions of doses of what seem to be promising vaccines to people may change the environment somewhat but like my, like my fellow panelists I'm pretty pessimistic that any major legislative changes will happen in the next two years. I just add that um, in addition to doing things uh, unilaterally using executive power, he can do a lot in foreign policy. Um, and I think the, the appointments he's made announced already shows that he's intent upon rebuilding American alliances. And one of the things that's odd about Trump is the extent to which he was interested in tearing down institutional structures that the United States has spent years building up. Um, so I think one of the most constructive things Biden can do is in foreign policy. Um, is there, to what extent do you think that sort of Trumpism um, is 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 very much connect is very much um, uh, tied to sort of to Trump himself? So if say that in the coming years, there's a way in which Trump himself is, um, you know, um, you know, silenced uh, by various lawsuits coming out of New York um, or what have you. Um, what will be the forces um, in the Republican Party or maybe outside um, that will that will continue um, that platform, if you want to call it, or that style of politics? Well, I think it's the media. I think it's the conserv. You know, I, I think the one of the major centers of power in the Republican Party right now is popular conservative media, and it's a lot more powerful than most politicians in the Republican Party. And Trump, I think, is often best understood as sort of a personification of the last 20, 30 years of talk radio and and cable news. Um, and I think he has a particular he has a particular personal charisma and communication style that I don't think just any other politician can replicate. Um, and I think you see other Republican politicians try to do it and they can't always pull it off as effectively as they can. But I think the general sort of attitude, combative attitude, orientation and themes of Trumpism are have been obvious for years in conservative media. There just used, used to be this sort of division of labor in the Republican Party between the, the candidates and the and the you know the the talk show hosts. And and Trump destroyed that barrier. And now it's um, you know now it's all one sort of set of people. But I, I think that doesn't go anywhere uh, even when he's no longer no longer the leader of the party. But is there, Dave, if I can follow up? Um... So how do we interpret the kind of conflict, if that's the right word for it, that we see now between Trump, that there's a way in which, you know, the kind of media that he seems to want is almost post-Fox. Um, 
that you know his his impatience with Fox having called Arizona for Biden um, and and everything that um, that's going on there. Like, do you see that 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 the media itself is going to be ever more radicalized? Um, and so you know maybe the creation of new platforms, maybe a, a um, rearrangement within the the media uh, landscape itself. I mean, it's possible. It's possible that there's a successor to Fox that's even more Trumpy than Fox. I mean, that 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 is possible. But I think the general idea here is that you have a political party that is, um, in, a, in a lot of a sense, being led by um, a bunch of, of television producers and television hosts. Um, and there are benefits to that. They're good at getting their message out. They're good at mobilizing their voters. There's, a, you know, the Republican Party, whatever else you want to say about it, is not having trouble winning elections, gaining power, exercising power. But then, of course, there, you know, there are other other costs to it. But I, I think it's it's a very much of a of a of a longstanding trend that this has been going on for a while. Trump is a symptom of it, a, a consequence of it, not just a cause of it. And so it doesn't necessarily go away when he goes away. I'd like to just go back to the point that Dave made a while ago about uh, Trump's ability to speak to people who feel they're being left behind. Um, because it strikes me that, that he has an extraordinary ability to do that. Um, and um, even with media help, I don't see that there are other Republicans uh, who are able to do that as he has. Um, and uh, if you look at Tom Cotton or uh, Cruz or Rubio, they don't seem to have the fit between their personal style and the media um, that Trump has had. I think it's an important point, the extent to which Trump is politically skilled and is related to um, a constituency that in a lot of ways Republicans have been eyeing for decades. Uh, and whether they'll stick with the Republicans without the glue of Trump. And one of the questions we have is what's literally gonna happen to Trump? You know, is he gonna face, uh, you know, is, is he gonna face legal issues? Another is his health. You know, he's in his mid seventies and he doesn't exactly live, you know, um, a life that predicts a long time. We don't know, he could live like my dad to be 97, but, <laughs> and, but without Trump, one of the things we know about the Republican party is how in ideological terms, it has drifted rightward over the last couple of decades. And, um, the mainstream Republican Party is now quite conservative. And we talk a lot about the fact that Trump has very successfully taken over the Republican Party. But one of the costs of that to Trump is that they took over his ideology. He ran in 2016 as a not very conservative Republican candidate, you know, talking about protecting things like Social Security and Medicare um, and emphasizing some less traditional Republican issues like immigration and trade, where you know the classic Republican po position is free trade. But one of his compromises is he has become very conservative. And so I think one of the futures of the Republican party is that that seems to be in place. We have a question from uh, Peter Skerry, who's asking if you believe that the way we conduct our elections, absentee ballots, drop boxes, vote harvesting, should be a cause of concern, especially in light of the claims made by the Trump supporters of election fraud. Um, it is my understanding, and I've been following this for some time, that when we began to get voter ID laws, the... Um, in a sense, the jury was out about the amount of, electoral, of election fraud we have. And that I think there's a consensus among political scientists that is absolutely minimal. Now, the particular kind of vote fraud that, um, that voter ID laws are um, in place to prevent 
are very rare because it forces you to commit a felony in front of your neighbors. <laughs> Just for the possibility of getting one vote, you go up and pretend you're somebody else or you vote twice or whatever. Um, with regard to such things as mail ballots, political scientists have known for a long time that um, an absentee mail ballot, and by the way, voter ID laws in most states don't even cover casting an absentee ballot, <laughs> um, are less likely to be counted, counted and counted correctly than ballot, ballots cast in person. And a lot of that has not, nothing to do with fraud. It has to do with things like the mails get not delivered correctly, or the boxes of mailed votes get stuck in um, a closet in town hall and legitimate, you know, forgotten through error. So, um, and in fact, the history of vote fraud is that there can be fraud from political elites in town hall who may have an incentive to forget those votes in the closet. But I think that the concerns that were raised about the level of vote fraud that came from mail ballots were overblown and the threat to democracy of making it easy to vote by mail, which a lot of states that have done it for some time like Colorado um, and Oregon have done successfully without accusations of fraud is in fact more endangering of democracy to the extent that it undermines the legitimacy of our electoral system. And to, under, to repeat what Shep said, what was really remarkable about an election at a time of pandemic when people couldn't be together um, is how few hitch glitches there were. So no, I'm not, if I'm gonna list the threats to democracy today, vote fraud on the basis of the fact that um, one could go to Brookline Town Hall and deposit a vote there. And you could even bring, you know, the votes of your relatives and neighbors if you wanted is less of a threat than unjustified attempts to delegitimize a, a voting process that I think went pretty well. I just quickly say that I'm not a, I've never been a big fan of absentee ballots. When I was running for the legislature, I saw some abuses. We corrected them, I think. Um, but um, my concern about um, mail-in ballots is not fraud. And I completely agree with what Kay said. I do think that actually going to vote in person is an important part of the sense of democratic commitment um, and community. Um, and I recognize that that's going to be a thing of the past. Um, I mourn it because I think that it's a sign of willingness to do sit, be civically engaged. If we can go to McDonald's or for a hamburger and go to Starbucks for coffee, I think we can go to town hall to vote. But I, that might be the type of nostalgia um, that, um, that shows how old I am. If somebody who lives in New Hampshire. I always enjoy voting, so. Yeah. By well, the way, absentee ballots um, came about as a way of helping people in the military to cast ballots. It, in fact, it, it's a Civil War legacy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see that uh, we're past the time of our panel. Um, thank you all for a really fascinating conversation. There is much more to talk about. So um, I think that we need to organize a part two here uh, in, the, in the near future. I had questions about where the Supreme Court is going and, and, and many other things. Uh, but um, with that said, uh, let me thank you again uh, for joining us today and also our viewers for, for being there and for the well, many yeah, interesting yeah. questions. Um, we will, uh, this, this conversation will be available um, online on the Cloud Center website. Um, and again, uh, thank you all for, for a really, really fascinating discussion. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.